it is time for exploring our of the rings and with uh, i always have to look to see who he is and which server Yarion! <laughs> so yeah so uh I, we're, we have a big treat tonight for the field trip i'm not going to tell right now we'll tell later but let's get started so i will be back later all right very good everybody hello and welcome back to exploring the lord of the rings uh so uh i'm uh, very excited to be back it was uh it was a long break and i've been missing you guys and not doing uh this broadcast recently uh just as well turns out that i didn't try to do it because my uh internet connection where i was last week ended up being pretty horrible so glad we didn't attempt that piece of futility but tonight we're back uh, and I am excited uh, to get, we are indeed going to get into chapter six tonight, if you, if you can believe that we've made it so far into this book already. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking into going into the old forest, uh, which is going to be pretty cool. Uh, uh, we're on uh, Crick Hollow server tonight, so uh, thanks everybody for having me here on Crick Hollow. And... Um, a uh, couple quick announcements, actually a bunch of uh, announcements, which I'll try to do briefly, because we've got a whole bunch of stuff coming up, and I know uh, several things that uh, a bunch of people have been waiting for. So I'm going to do these in uh, in order of, uh, uh, of of increasing immediacy, going through the announcements here. So the furthest thing out that I'm going to announce, uh, on the 25th of July, in the afternoon, on the 25th of July, uh, Signum University is hosting a roundtable discussion on Game of Thrones, looking at both the books uh, and the TV series. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan, uh, uh, definitely a great opportunity. Uh, you, you'll definitely uh, want to be in that conversation. Um, you can find a link to that. Go to Signum University org and scroll down just a little bit and you'll see the link to the Game of Thrones uh, page, so uh, the event page. Uh, so that's happening on the 25th. Next Wednesday, the 19th of July, we are finally beginning the treason of Isengard. I'm very excited. We're getting back to the history of the Lord of the Rings. Uh, so this is in the Mythgard Academy series. Uh, this book was elected uh, by our... Uh, by our, our, our worthy electorate. And so we're going to be going through the Treason of Isengard. It's pretty thick. It's going to take us a while. I have a scheduled for 15 weeks. I'm feeling pretty confident in the 15 weeks. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, we uh, uh, so the tree just so again for those of you who who aren't familiar with this, uh, this is going to be a super super fun opportunity. Um, the Return of the Shadow class was awesome. So we did uh, so we just finished Boethius's Constellation of Philosophy. Before that, we did the Return of the Shadow, which is the first volume of the History of the Lord of the Rings, Volume Six of the History of Middle Earth, Volume One though of the History of the Lord of the Rings. So we looked from the earliest draft of the long expected party all the way through, you know, we get, uh, we, 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 we got to, it's hard to say exactly where we got to, because of course Tolkien goes back and starts again several times. So we got to Rivendell a couple times. Uh, the high water mark that uh, he reached by the end, you know, that the manuscripts reached, I should say, by the time we got to the end of The Return of the Shadow, was at Balin's tomb. So they, they, they get to Balin's tomb, they find Balin dead, and then the story breaks off, and of course, that's actually where Tolkien paused for quite some time—a uh, matter of a uh, matter of many months—that uh, he didn't write anymore after he got to, to Balin's tomb. So it's a very fitting place for Christopher Tolkien to break between volumes uh, of this series. But we're going to come back to the Treason of Isengard. Um, we're going to get into Rohan. We're going to—we're going to—the uh, Treason of Isengard will see things like. The invention of Galadriel. Galadriel will finally emerge. She has never been in Tolkien stories. You know, there's so many of the characters from The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit that you go back, and of course they have their roots back in the stories that Tolkien had been writing for decades before Elrond, of course, most famously uh, among uh, among those. Glorfindel, of course, also uh, with an intriguing role, right, uh, there as well. Galadriel, however, not at all, right? She was not a glimmer. Uh, in Tolkien's mind until we get there. And in fact, through the entirety of The Return of the Shadow, there was no hint at a forthcoming elf queen, right? So uh, so that's going to be one of the... So the, the, the Lothlorien stuff is going to be uh, uh, central. Of course, we're going to get the Balrog. 
Uh, we're going to get other really, really exciting events, such as the evolution of Bilbo's poem that he sings at Rivendell. My favorite chapter in Treason of Isengard, the, the Erin Tree chapter. So anyway, it's going to be great. So that's going to start, as I said, next Wednesday. Uh, and there's the, the web page for that is up, so you can find the uh, week-by-week schedule, which I'm going to adhere to very scrupulously, as always. You can find... <laughs> that's slightly joking, but really probably... The, uh, um, um, I, I really think I'm gonna. We're gonna be okay, and um, uh, and you can find the link to register. Uh, I'm going to be simulcasting uh, that like right now tonight, of course. Uh, by the way, I'm simulcasting tonight's class on Twitch Live for the first time, which because I've been really enjoying doing Twitch Live, so that's been fun. Uh, so we're gonna do Twitch Live. Um, so I'm doing Twitch Live for this class. I think I'm going to try Facebook Live, which I've never tried before. I'm going to try Facebook Live for the Treason of Isengard class. Um, and we'll also be simulcasting it here on Twitch as well. Um, anyway, so Treason of Isengard starting next Wednesday. Now, moving again, again, increasing immediacy, right? This Friday, this Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, we are finally beginning Silm Film Season 3, so the third season of the Silmarillion Film Project. Um, that's been sort of in hiatus between Season 2 and 3, uh, but we are now finally gearing up to begin. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Silm Film, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a really, really fun project that, um, uh, that I think is... Something that Tolkien fans, I think, it's I hope will really get get interested in the concept of film. Film very briefly is we are we are planning a completely theoretical adaptation of the Silmarillion um, as a really great opportunity to dig into the stories and the characters and really imagine our way through this story in a way that's that's new um, and that we've never. Uh, you know, the, the ways in which you've probably not thought about it before. I have found it a very um, uh, mind-opening thing. It's been a really great experience for me. I've been so excited uh, about it. I can't wait to get into season three. So we're doing... Um, we're, we're, we're splitting it up into 13-episode seasons, um, as if we were going to, you know, release it on Netflix or something. And season three, so season two ended with the darkening of Valinor. So we got like the Valar in season one from the Ainulindale up through the chaining of Melkor. Season two uh, followed the elves from the awakening by the shores of Quivian and through the darkening of Valinor. Now we're going to pick up right after the darkening of Valinor. So episode one will probably be like Feanor's speech under torchlight, right when he's going to swear the oath of Feanor and stuff. Uh, and then and then so we're going to get the kinslaying pretty early on. Um, and we're going to go through... We haven't decided exactly where we're going to end yet. That's what we're going to be talking about on Friday, as we're going to be discussing the scope uh, of Season 3 and making some decisions about that. Um, so, and yes, for those of you who are watching this on Twitter, this is live. This is this is, this is is happening live. I can see your comments on Twitter. Um, I will apologize in advance. I'm following people's comments on three or four different channels here, so I might not see everybody's comments at all times. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll 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 see what we can do. Anyway, okay. So, film film Friday. This Friday, it's so it happens every other week. Friday, 10 a.m. Uh, you can also follow it, of course, on the Tolkien Professor uh, website. The other thing that's going to be new in season three is we're going to be doing a uh, uh, video stream. Uh, with film film we, we we've been doing just audio for years but we're going to start with uh um doing uh video so okay all right and uh the um final announcement which is just sort of, sort of just to note something which already is happening this is the first week of our hobbit immersion camp you've heard me if you've been following this class you've heard me announce that before uh it's actually happening right now our first ever uh, uh online tolkien camp for kids um it has been awesome it has been so much fun i have i'm not teaching that class um it's being taught by a real professional like a real honest to god middle school teacher who is so oh my gosh you guys would be amazed right like today for instance right uh t today 
uh, uh, Dime Binkley, who many of you know from Lotro, she's uh, you know part of our, our Mythgard kinship. You, she appears on uh, Girls of Middle Earth and and is with us on many of our questings and stuff. Um, uh, Dime is wonderful. She's a professional middle school teacher. Has been teaching Tolkien in middle school for a long time. What she did today just absolutely blew my mind. Uh, she was walking them through chapters three and four. Uh, of The Hobbit. She got through like 20 slides in an hour and answered like a hundred questions. I mean, I was transferring the questions to her, right? I was like passing the questions along and those things were coming so fast that it was like, it was, it was incredible. The, um, um, the, 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 the kids are awesome. I love the questions that they ask. You can see them like trying to kind of wrap their minds around the stuff that's going on in the book in some really, really fun ways. Like for instance, in yesterday's class, you know, the questions this they were coming in, I just loved them. I just loved them. They were like, you know, it's like the first person was like, okay, so we got to the trolls, right? And they're like, could a troll kill a dragon? <laughs> yeah, it was like trolls versus dragons. Who would win, right? Uh, and uh, and then you know, then DMA is like, well, yeah, I think clearly a dragon would 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 win that fight. But okay, okay, okay. And then they're like, okay, but what about wolves? Would would trolls eat wolves, right? How about birds? Would trolls eat birds? Like, what was the pot made out of that the trolls were using? Why did they drink beer? You know, they're like all these questions that they kept doing. They just kept, kept pouring in all kinds of things about everything. It was really, really great. Um, the kids in the Hobbit immersion class, Crystal, are, it's middle school age. Uh, so it's designed for kids like age 10 to 13, basically. Um, and uh, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was really cool. Uh, it's been really cool. Today was only day two. We still have eight more days of coolness after this. So I've been, uh, uh, I've been having a great time. Um, uh, yeah, Oakwig, I agree. Their questions were fascinating. Yeah, they asked, did Gandalf play an instrument, right? And it's like, well, yeah, wait, does Gandalf play an instrument? Like, you'd think he would, right? I mean, he didn't. I mean, it's not recorded that he played one with the Dwarvish Ensemble in Chapter 1, but but it really kind of makes you think, doesn't it, Oakwig? It's like, that surely Gandalf plays some kind of musical instrument, right? He can't be totally non-musical. That's, that, that couldn't be, right? Uh, Amethorn suggests the trombone. I, I like to think of Gandalf as a trombone player. I think uh, I think he would he would play brass. That seems that seems very likely. Bagpipes? See, I don't know. Gandalf doesn't seem like a bag bagpipes kind of guy to me. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, I could see him playing the horn. You know, yeah, that would work for me. Um, uh, anyway, sorry. Okay, I'm getting I'm getting it. the bassoon. Well, wow, see, Karita, you know that could work. That could work. Not the triangle. He would absolutely not play the triangle. He'd have a much bigger role than that, right? Or maybe like, because of his humility, right? He would be. He would be like the dude waiting there and just being like, "Ting," right, to accentuate the piece. I could see that. Um, okay, now Lady Schmebulak wants somebody to Photoshop Gandalf playing jazz, which I agree, kind of should happen. All right. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> Enough, enough, enough. All right, those are the announcements. Uh, Game of Thrones uh, Roundtable. Uh, Treason of Isengard starting next Wednesday. Film Film Season 3 starting this Friday. And Hobbit Camp going on now and being incredibly awesome. So uh, that brings us uh, to... Um, our actual class today. Uh, so I had bunches of good questions as always. Um, I, I, it was hard to, I couldn't choose them all today, but here's a few. Um, uh, tonight's class is called entering the wild. Um, this is really, you know, that, that, that emphasis on the wild, uh, versus sort of the tame world. Again, I've been thinking about the Hobbit a lot and Hobbit immersion camp going on. And Ooh, I forgot to tell you, guess what happened? Oh my gosh. My son, Charmandy, you know, the one who streams with me sometime, came up to me on Sunday and asked me to read The Hobbit with him. And I was like, I didn't burst into tears. Like, I totally, like, you know, didn't cry. Uh, but I've been waiting for that for so many. And I, and I keep waiting. I, I try, you know, 
Tolkien is it's such a complicated thing for me because, you know, as I've said this before, my kids know that this is like my day job, right? I mean, like they know I'm like a professional Tolkien guy. So I don't want to be pushing it on them because the last thing I would want is for them to feel like it's like the family business, you know, that like they have to do or something. Uh, so I've been and I've been very kind of waiting on them. And anyway, so I am so excited. We're re- we just read chapter three tonight uh, and it's been uh, um it's been it's been super cool. So anyway, um, so as, as I say, been thinking about The Hobbit. And in The Hobbit, there's that big deal made about the crossing over into the wild, right? You're now on the edge of the wild. The last homely house. One of the kids in The Hobbit camp asked this today. What does last homely house mean? In what sense is it the last homely house? It's the last homely house on the edge of the wild, right? So as you're going from the tame lands, the friendly lands, the populated lands, the civilized lands, and crossing over into Wilderland, into the wild, right? Um, again, that's 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 a big deal. That kind of language is repeated a lot in The Hobbit. We don't get that same kind of language. They don't talk about the wild with a capital W in the same way or nearly as pers- persistently in The Lord of the Rings as they did in The Hobbit. But in tonight's class, when they cross over from Buckland into the Old Forest, we can see that boundary much, much sharper than we see it. Uh, in The Hobbit, because, like, it had already gotten pretty wild by the time they got to Rivendell, right? So when they got to the other side of Rivendell, they were, like, officially in Wilderland, but they had already kind of been in rough territory for a while. Um, The boundary is extremely sharp. It's a very black and white boundary between the civilized world uh, and the wild uh, in Chapter 6. And so this moment of crossing over, uh, this is really, um, this is really a big... a huge deal, and of course, we've already been looking at what a big deal it is for Frodo, the choice that he's making to leave the Shire behind, uh, and that's really something that uh, that takes on a new significance, leaving the Shire behind, um, when it actually happens, when they actually go through with it here in uh, here in chapter six. Um, okay, so that's what we're talking about today. But first, questions from our discussion board. So this from Julia Grammer. And Julia's taken us back to chapter two again, but this is a this is an important issue. Um, I've talked about this on a couple other occasions before, but it's worth acknowledging, and we, I didn't really talk about this uh, when we went through it before. Gandalf threatening to torture Gollum, right? So it's, it's, uh, she starts off by quoting the passage. I endured him as long as I could, but the truth was desperately important, and in the end I had to be harsh. I put the fear of fire on him and wrung the true story out of him bit by bit, together with much sniveling and snarling. Gandalf is explaining to Frodo how he discovered the true story of Gollum's life. I've read The Fellowship of the Ring many times, but I never paid very close attention to this particular passage. Does it mean what I think it means? Is Gandalf actually suggesting that he threatened to torture, or actually did torture, Gollum in order to learn the truth? I put the fear of fire on him does suggest, taken in the most positive way possible, at least a threat, even if it is an empty one. However, the following phrase, and wrung the true story out of him bit by bit, makes it seem like he actually carried out his threat. I find this very hard to meld with my own mental image of Gandalf, a fundamentally compassionate and empathetic person who would never condone torture. If we take this passage as a suggestion that he actually did torture Gollum, it seems like he's willing to put aside his own moral scruples for the good of the world at large, since the information he needs is desperately important. Indeed, it is vital for the continuation of Middle-earth as we know it, but I still find it hard to believe that Gandalf, pupil of Nienna, the Vala of pity, grief, and compassion, would ever resort to torture. Great issue. Glad you brought that up, Julia. I didn't mean to skim over that, Uh, so uh, I'm really glad it came up again. Okay, first... Do so. Let's 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 address first the basic question of fact. Does this suggest that Gandalf actually does torture? You know, like uh, you know, burn Gollum and torture him in order to get him to talk? I would say no. And I I believe. I, I mean, of course, you know, Julia. Let me start off by saying I feel the same kind of bias, if bias is the right word for it, that you do. That is to say, I don't want to believe that Gandalf would do this. It doesn't seem to me that it would fit him. So I have to admit when I come into looking at this passage that I know that I'm looking at it like wanting to find a particular thing, right? Wanting to find that he didn't do it, right? So I I always have to be careful when I acknowledge, when I recognize the fact that I'm, um, uh, that I'm, I'm, 
biased or that I have an agenda in a sense, right? Looking at it. So I, I do have an agenda here, but I don't think that it is, that it is. So the, the, the thing, uh, Julia, the passage you brought up about wringing the true story out of him bit by bit, um, it is a really fascinating metaphor, right? I mean, it sounds like he's like putting him on the rack or something like that. But in fact, that's actually what convinces me that he's being metaphorical there because it's a mixed metaphor, right? He's not going to put the... F- <laughs> like. I don't think that Gandalf is going to be like, so first I burned him and then I put him on the rack, right? I don't think that... So I don't think the ringing is literal, uh, you know, that, that he's being squeezed or, or twisted or something like that uh, in in order to make him talk um, because that's not what Gandalf was talking about. Gandalf talked about the fear of fire specifically, right? Um, so I cannot see any way to interpret that without understanding Gandalf threatening him. That seems very clear. He cannot put the fear of fire in him without at least implicitly threatening to burn him, right? Um, now, we know that... Well, we know. We don't know yet, right? But we will... If, you know, if Looking back, thinking for a second about the whole Lord of the Rings, right? Thinking forward uh, to what we see when we meet Gollum, we know that Gollum freaks out at fire, Right? nasty cruel tongues right you know he the 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 cruel red tongues he 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 doesn't like fire um so it seems possible of course that gandalf would not have to would not have had to do too much right um in order to put the fear of fire in him like I, that's not even to say that he need necessarily have like conjured a fire and brought it close but not quite burning him or something like that did it even come to that i don't know but clearly he threatened him with fire um he seems to have explicitly made Gollum believe that he, Gollum, might be burned if he didn't speak, right, and didn't tell them the truth. Um, that I think we can't avoid. Again, I think the wringing the story out of him bit by bit is a metaphor, a metaphor which expresses Gandalf's own exasperation, right? Like, uh, you know, it was like wringing water out of a towel to find out. I mean, that's how much work it was to get the story out of him. I don't think that he's saying that he literally twisted again or, or tortured him there. So, okay. Um, uh, so, um, where does this put us? Because, of course, the, the, the two points that Julia makes are excellent. First of all, there's just the general moral issue, right? Um, and it's this is independent of whether, you know, like our own views. Um, some people, and I can see some of you in the in the Discord chat right now, are talking about, like, old-fashioned ways of looking at things versus more modern sensibilities. I agree with Julia that that isn't relevant, right? What matters is looking at it in sort of the moral economy of Tolkien's world, of the Lord of the Rings itself. Um, and what we see again and again is that wicked means do not achieve good ends that that doesn't happen that doesn't work i don't know that that ever works um so i i i i agree so that is to say i agree that makes this a big issue right if gandalf has to torture him in or or even just threaten to torture him uh to uh to get him to talk that seems really bad right i am going to partially uh, cop out on answering this question. Let me explain. It's not because I don't want to talk about it, but what I do want to do is wait until we have more data. The bad thing about that is that means waiting until book four, and we're not halfway through book one yet. So uh, um, I promise by 2021 we'll talk about this. Um, But basically... What I want to say is, let's keep this in mind when we get to Frodo and Gollum. Because what we're going to see is Frodo in a very similar case. And I, you know, all we have about Gandalf and Frodo and and Gollum's interaction is what Gandalf says in this one sentence. Okay, two, two sentences. In these two sentences, right? Um, With Frodo and Gollum, we get much, much more detail, right? Um... And so we can see this whole scenario um, and the way that Frodo kind of walks this line with Gollum. We can see that a lot more clearly. 
Um, and therefore, I think there we'll have a lot more. Again, it's not to say that we can necessarily just then project that back onto Gandalf, but I think if what we want is to see how does Tolkien explore this issue, this issue then I think the answer to that is let's wait and look at when he actually discusses it, right, uh, in more detail himself later on. The one other thing that I would say, um, just for now, because again, I don't want to just totally uh, uh, set it up and then refuse to answer it. Here's the one way that I have to understand it. And Julia, uh, here, Julia, here I'm coming back to the point that you made at the end, which is, I think, an excellent one. Um, you find it hard to believe that Gandalf, pupil of Nienna, the Vala of pity, grief, and compassion, would ever resort to torture. Yes. Um, here's the one the one way in which I suggest that it could be understood from Gandalf's point of view. Not merely as an expedient, right? Not merely as, normally I wouldn't have done this, but it was super important and the means justify, you know, the, you know, the ends justify the means, and so therefore I did it, right? Not necessarily uh, in that way. But I would put this in the context of the way that Gandalf talks about Gollum, right? So forget about Gandalf and Gandalf's moral choice for a second, and think instead about what all the things that Gandalf has said about Gollum there in chapter two, about him being not wholly ruined, right? And yet also recognizing that though he's not wholly ruined, he's pretty ruined, right? Um, he, he, he doesn't, um, he is a liar, right? Um, so again, we'll talk about this more later, but what I would say about it, I'm trying to think of the right way to put it. And I'm not sure this is the right way, but I'll give it a shot. I think in threatening him, Gandalf was, in a sense, speaking Gollum's language. Gollum doesn't understand. Uh, they can't. He can't appeal to Gollum, right? Um, but Gollum understands threats, right? In a sense, he's sort of speaking in Gollum's idiom. We'll see, again, more on this later on. Um, I don't think that this is just Gandalf weakening in his principles, but I agree this is a really interesting point. And again, don't forget this passage. This is going to be really important later. Uh, Frodo's, Frodo's relationship and Sam's relationship to Gollum is a really interesting and a really important one uh, in the Two Towers especially and also in The Return of the King. Um... And I think that this little background glimpse that we get into Gandalf's treatment of him uh, earlier on is a really important setup for that. Um, but um, yeah. Anyway, so we'll 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 come back to that. Sorry for not for not giving a, a, any more kind of definitive answer right now. Uh, but we'll come back to it really yeah, uh, uh, really soon. <laughs> <laughs> soon, you know, uh, at least Aslan would call it soon if nobody else would. All right. Question number two. We're, we're, we're ripping through things tonight. I'm never even going to get to, uh, uh, through my, uh, my goal is four pages again tonight. We'll see. I might not get through four pages. Um, okay. Great question, Julia. Thank you so much for asking that. Okay. Finn says, just a quick question about what I feel is a major fail on Frodo's part re regarding the Sackville Bagginses and the Gaffer. One would think Frodo, being a more than typical hobbit of the Shire, would have thought about what would happen to the Gaffer should he sell his beloved bag in to the Sackville Bagginses, especially to the Sackville Bagginses. I realize if I put myself in Frodo's shoes that I have a great many things on my mind, the ring not the least, and that I would tend to forget about certain things, that notwithstanding. I would think he would have given thought to the gaffer and made arrangements for him prior to the sale of Bag End. Something to the effect of, with the sale of this property, let it be known that the residents of Bagshot Row, though not being owners of said property, shall remain residents of said property until they wish to leave. Kind of think Frodo should have made some kind of stipulation in the sale of Bag End, just for the protection of the hobbits on the row. Um, great, great question. First of all, can I just say in general, I love the... 
the kind of thought that we together have been giving to like the Gamgees and the, the, the sort of social and class relationship between the Gamgees and the Bagginses, uh, you know, over the last couple months as we've been going through these passages has been really fun uh, and something that I haven't, I think, thought about enough in the past. So it's been really fun for me uh, to be thinking about this stuff uh, in, in new ways. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, but OK, a couple things here. First of all, um, I don't think there's any reason to believe that Frodo didn't. I mean, we're not told explicitly, um, but I don't think there's any necessary reason to believe that Frodo didn't make such a stipulation in the sale of Bag End. Um, we know that the uh, the home, you know, the Bagshot Row, the sort of legal, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, ownership or... Um, uh, what's the word, landlordship, right, of, uh, of Bagshot Row, does go along with the sale of Bag End because we do, in fact, see that, Lo- that uh, uh, Lotho is going to turn them out and dig up Bagshot Row um, uh, and later on. But note that this is going to be held as a grievance, right? Um, I think it very likely uh, that Frodo would have Stip- so stipulated that, uh, you know, that they should be allowed, that, you know, that by purchasing Bag End on this, you know, on this sales contract that uh, that they are agreeing to allow the Gamgees and, and, and the others to continue living in Bagshot Row and that Lotho is breaking the contract when he digs up Bagsh- Bagshot Row as he begins progressive. Because remember, Lotho operates within Shire law at first, right, merely buying up extra land legally. And only afterwards does he begin to lord it over others and to begin to seize things. Uh, and that's, of course, chiefly when Sharky's men are more and more in charge. Um, so anyway, I, I think that the digging up a bagshot row reflects a crossing a, the line legally uh, on Lotho's part. Uh, the other thing that I would encourage you to remember is the Gaffer Gamgee acknowledges exactly, Finn, what you're talking about here. Remember the first thing that the gaffer says to Frodo when they meet again uh, in the scouring of the Shire chapter, right? He says, I have a bone to pick with you in a manner of speaking, right? Uh, you, you, you did not to have sold Bag End, right? That's exactly what he's saying. And, and he points out like how they've, 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 they've done and dug up my taters, right? This is what he's complaining about. Um, and he does... Basically, by saying he's got a bone to pick with Frodo, he lays that at Frodo's feet, right? He's like, this is your fault. I was, I got kicked out of my house and they dug up my taters. You didn't ought to have sold Bag End, right? And this is what happened as a consequence of it, right? And then Frodo says, you know, I will, I will do everything I can to make amends. And Gaffer says, well, you can't say not fairer than that, right? Uh, so he's totally satisfied with that response. Um, so anyway, so the, it, it does, Finn, it does come up. Uh, later on, uh, but I don't think even that necessarily means that that Frodo gave no thought to it. Um, I believe that the uh, the my, my own suspicion is that the kicking out of the gaffer in ba- from Bagshot Row was done extra legally, not according to the original contract. Um, but uh, anyway. We do know there was a contract. Uh, remember, there's a list that Lobelia has of the, the effects that were included in the sale, right? So we know that there are legal documents and, and uh, that the, we know that the legal traditions of hobbits are more elaborate uh, on average, right, than the, 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 the legal documentation needed among humans. So, uh, so there would have been, even though, you know, he had other things on his mind, there would have been a legal contract, and I can't imagine... I can't imagine that uh, he didn't think of that. <laughs> Julia says that uh, they, they, the, the Sackville Baggins is out to pay a wear guild for the, for the, for the gaffer's taters. Uh, indeed, yeah, yeah, per spud, I would think. Um, absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah, good, good. Okay, all right, so I'm going to keep going because we're on a roll now. Quick one, this was from Twitter. I just got a couple days ago from the Uncommon Fan. Big Atlanta sports fan, it seems. Uh, and he says, how distinct are Frodo's clothes that they would be recognized at a distance, uh, that they would be recognized at a distance that Fatty's face wouldn't? How many people in Buckland would recognize Fatty or Frodo by appearance? Great question. And again, another thing I'd never thought of before. Um, 
But because of course there's that business about Fatty having some of Frodo's clothes to help him in playing the part, right? He's supposed to make people believe that Frodo is still there. Um, so let me answer the second question first. How many people in Buckland would recognize Fatty or Frodo by appearance? Um, and we know the answer in both of those cases. How many people would recognize Fatty Bulger by appearance in in Buckland? None. Zero. He's never been across uh, 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 the Brandywine in his life. This is his first trip across the Brandywine, right? Um, so other than maybe a couple Brandy Bucks, friends of Mary's maybe, who might have come along with Mary to visit him in Budgeford, probably none, right? So Fatty is a complete unknown. How many would recognize Frodo by appearance? Lots. Lots. Um, maybe not any of the really young kids, right? But most of the grown-ups are going to remember him. He grew up there. He lived there for a long time. Um, so Frodo himself would be relatively well-known. And yeah, I think the answer um, to the first question is just exactly along the lines um, that uh, Matt DeForest is suggesting in the chat right now. Frodo's clothes would have been of a certain class. That's likely to be enough. Exactly. Um, upper class and lower class people uh, would have been, you know, sartorially marked much more obviously, even from a distance, right? Just as, and again, I'm only using this as an illustration, I'm not saying this would have been the actual clothes in question, just like you can tell the, tell the difference from a, a fair long ways off, right, whether somebody is wearing denim overalls or whether they're wearing a suit, you know, like a, 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 a three-piece suit, right? You can tell the difference from a distance, even before you can see the person. I think that's the kind of thing that they're talking about here, um, that he would, he has some of Frodo's clothes, and I don't know, maybe maybe they wouldn't be quite the same as the clothes that they wear in Buckland. I don't know how different are the, the fashions in clothes, right? But if you think about it that way, right, on the one hand, he's a, he's, he's a, he's a gentleman, right? He's like landed gentry hobbit, so he would have uh, uh, fairly fancy clothes. R remember um, uh, uh, Bilbo with his brightly colored waistcoats with gold buttons, right? Right, kind of gentrified, right? Um, so he would, uh, he, would be, he would be gentry, but foreign gentry in a sense, Right. Um, so probably not following whatever the latest Buckland fashions were, not following those. Right. Uh, following his own, uh, uh, you know, following something different. Right. Whatever, whatever it is. So that combination might be enough to make people think it's, oh, yeah, that Frodo Baggins who's back. Right. If they see him from a distance. Um, but if they see him up close, they're going to know they're not going to recognize who Fatty Bulger is, but they're going to recognize that he's not Frodo, right? So it is an interesting kind of game that Fatty is sp supposed to play. He doesn't want the house to look unoccupied. He's got to avoid anybody who comes to the door, right? Because he can't talk to them. Um, but he... Um, uh, but he has to make the house look occupied. He should ideally let himself be seen, sort of walking around, so that people can know that 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 you know Frodo Baggins is there, right? But again, not to uh, let himself become uh, become uh, approached. So it's um, it's tricky. It's tricky. Um, and yes, gravity avoiding people that come to the door is a Baggins thing anyway, right? Yeah, so you know he can he can kind of he can kind of pass that off maybe as uh, a kind of eccentricity that Frodo might have picked up among those queer folk out Hobbiton way, right? Uh, so, so that's my suspicions there. But great questions. I thought that that was that was really that was really neat. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, I say okay. Uh, oh, Brandon was asking, how long ago did Frodo go to Bag End on a permanent basis? Oh, yeah, it was, it was, it was like, yeah, a while ago. So again, yeah, exactly. As Finn was saying, we know it's been seventeen years since Bilbo left, right? So um, he was what in his teens or twenties? I mean, it's been over twenty-five years. Has to be over twenty-five years uh, since Frodo's parents died. Um, somebody look it up in the Tale of Years. I think the death of uh, of Frodo's parents is listed in the tale of years. Um, but yeah, so 25, 30 years, which again, is not all that long, right? I mean, again, it means anybody, you know, who hasn't come of age yet won't remember him personally, but, um, 
but everybody else will, you know, and that's really quite a lot of people. Okay, last one. Matthew Hershenroder with a great point about Pippin. He says, We've given Pippin a hard time for being on a Hobbit walking party while being pursued by Black Riders, but might his attitude be at least in part an act? Pippin, Merry, and Fatty are all pretending they don't know what Frodo is about in his supposed move to Crick Hollow. Later on, we'll see Pippin pretend he has the ring when he's captured by the Uruk Hai, so he's not above a little deception. Maybe he's not as stupid as he first appears. Pippin's line of, well, it's time you made it up to Farmer Maggot, especially if you're coming back to live in Buckland, takes on a whole new level when we realize that Pippin already knows that Frodo has no intention of staying in Buckland more than a few days. Here is Pippin trying to force Frodo to confront his childhood boogeyman when he is fully aware that Frodo is soon leaving and has no real need to be on good terms with the locals. Um, great point, and fa- fa- fabulous point about uh, Farmer Maggot there in particular, so thank you for that, uh, for that Matt. That's a great, uh, great observation. A um, couple things that I would say about this. So first of all, yes, it, we should go back and look at all those passages in Chapter 3, especially when we were talking about Pippin you know, being on the Hobbit walking party, right? Not having a care in the world. Um, However, I don't think we can let Pippin entirely off the hook about this. On the one hand, it is clear that he is to some extent playing dumb, right? Um, You know, here's Frodo. Remember that very scene when Frodo is looking back and saying to himself, I wonder if I shall ever look down into that valley again, right? And Pippin is like, hey, hey, whoa, we're having a good time walking across the Shire, right? So the contrast there seems in retrospect, rather pointed. Um, And so was he just acting? Yes. I don't think that means he was faking it, though. I think he was enjoying a Hobbit walking party. He does know that there's more to it, um, but I don't think he gets it. And I think that what we saw last time, or the time before last or something, it was so long ago now I don't even remember, but after the song, right? Uh, Pippin's response to the song, the, uh, oh, that was poetry line. Remember, we were looking both at the content of the song itself and then Pippin's reaction to the song or to Frodo's unexpected application of the song, right? Um, And suggesting, I think maybe he doesn't really get it, right? Um, He doesn't fully understand that the significant, the full significance of this thing. So I think he's still kind of in Hobbit walking party mode, right? I think the things that we said about him are still true. Um, despite the fact that he knew that this other stuff was happening, right, and that they were actually leaving. The uh, the second thing. Um, oh, Oakwig, Frodo was only 12, right. Okay, so it's been 38 years. Okay, good. So it's been 38 years. Um, I remember, I, I mean, I, I, I couldn't remember the dates. I remembered... Um, Gaffer Gamgee saying, you know, and poor Frodo, only a lad and all, right? So I knew he was young, but I couldn't remember how how young. So yeah, he was 12. Uh, so, right, so, and he's 50 now. So yeah, it's been 38 years uh, since he moved out again, a long time, but not forever. Anyway, um, but on to the Farmer Maggot point, right? Great point. How do we understand this in the, in the, in the context, right? It sounds like he's just being totally, you know... Uh, disingenuous, right? Like, oh, well, yeah, yeah, totally. You should uh, make up the farmer maggot since you're coming here to stay and all. I think he's teasing him, right? Um, I think this is something which he expects because not only does he know more than Frodo thinks he knows, Pippin also knows that they're about to reveal the conspiracy, right? He knows when they get to when they get to to uh, Crick Hollow, it's all going to come out. Right, which at that point is tomorrow, right? At the, when the, when they're at Farmer Maggot, they're going to be at Crick Hollow tomorrow, and it's going to come out, right? I think that Pippin is already thinking about how funny that comment is going to look in retrospect, right? When uh, Frodo remembers how he was encouraging him to make friends with Farmer Maggot, even though he knew all the time that he was going to be leaving, right? I, my suspicion is that at the moment that he says that, Pippin is expecting how he and Frodo are going to laugh about that tomorrow, right? Um, uh, on, that's my honest read of, of Pippin's whole attitude here. He, so I don't see him as being cunning, exactly. I see him as being witty more than cunning, if you see what I mean, right? He knows what's going on, but that to him seems to be exactly, Julia, a joke with a delayed punchline, right? 
Exactly. That seems to me how Pippin treats this um, at this point. And I'm not saying, of course, he doesn't take the journey at all seriously or anything like that. But we can see the whole the real seriousness of the situation hasn't fully set in even after they've been pursued uh, by the Black Riders. Um, so. uh uh, so yeah, I, that, that's that's my sense. But but again, great observations, Matthew. Uh, really glad you pointed this out. All right, now we're now we're uh, uh, halfway through class. It's time to begin. So we've been waiting for what like two three weeks to get to this passage. We got right up to Frodo's dream at the end of chapter five, and then I was like, well, we'll have to wait. So here it is, finally, uh, passage that we've been waiting for for a long time. Frodo's dream. Okay. Um, first of all, before we talk about this dream, let's remember our, the context. Let's remember our family history. Uh, dream, significant dreams happen several times in The Hobbit, right? Can anybody remember? Pop quiz. What dreams does Bilbo have in The Hobbit? Do people remember some of Bilbo's dreams? So we can get some kind of context um, that we can that we can bring into this. Anybody recall Hobbit dreams? Yes, good. Uh, J.J. Bilbo looking for something in Bag End, uh, something that he had misplaced and not remembering what it was. That is the dream that he has while he's up in the Eagle's Eyrie, right? And we're never told the exact significance of that, right? Good, yes, on Twitter there in the House of Bjorn. Yes, he has another dream in the House of Bjorn um, about... Uh, uh, about the bears dancing outside, right? And, yes, no, no, right, Nick, Smaug has a dream, too. We'll come back to that in a second. Um, Yes, his dreaming of the front porch in Goblin Town. Absolutely. So, um, uh, so, so, okay, so Bilbo has those three dreams, right? He dreams of himself being in Bag End and looking for something that he can't find or remember what it is. The Goblin Cave in Chapter Four, the dream, the vivid dream that he has of basically what was really happening, right, or just about to happen with the goblins opening. He dreams that a crack opens, right, and 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 uh, and the the horse, the ponies are led back, right. So he he dreams about what is actually happening or what is about to happen, um, and that does seem to be really a dream that he's having, not just like he was kind of half asleep and perceiving it, right? He dreams it. Similarly, um, because we see, the dream that he has at Bjorn's house is similar, where he has a dream of the bears sort of dancing outside, uh, and then he goes out in the morning and finds footprints there, right? like something quite like his dream really happened, right? And then to this, Nick, I would add Smaug's dream, right? It's not Bilbo's dream, but we know that Smaug has a dream, um, which is not exactly a prophetic dream. Right, because he does not he he uh, he has a dream in which a, a a warrior altogether insignificant in size, uh, uh, but armed with a bitter sword and great courage, uh, figured most un, uncomfortably. Right in Smaug's dream, and that's of course not what happens to Smaug. Right, so it's he does not Smaug does not have a prophetic dream, but of course it is interesting that he has a dream of being slain uh, by a small hero with a sword. The you know at the time that Bilbo is coming down uh, to his hole, um, and uh, yes, Nick, I always too thought that that uh, my favorite interpretation of Smaug's dream is that this is like a racial memory, right? That he's having a dream of Turin killing Glaurung, uh, and uh, uh, and thinking about that. Um, yeah, exactly. Race memory was just exactly what Tony Mead just said. Um, yeah, Simon, then there's that interpretation of Smaug dreaming of Tolkien's original manuscript. Yeah, I've never been 100% convinced of that. I, the fact that Smaug describes the warrior as small in stature doesn't necessarily convince me that it's of hobbit stature. I think that Smaug would consider Turin a warrior of small stature. All humans are of small stature compared to him. Uh, so I think that that's what it's talking about. That sort of talking about sort of conveying Smaug's attitude towards any human warrior that would stand up to him. We see how arrogant and proud and puffed up Smaug is, right, by his speech. Uh, so I, I, I don't necess- that doesn't necessarily convince me that it's really a hobbit that he's thinking of. 
but it certainly is a fun kind of coincidence. If you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, the very first draft that Tolkien wrote of The Hobbit, he actually had Bilbo stabbing Smaug to death. Uh, Bilbo was going to sneak down a third time and stab Smaug to death through the hole in his chest with Sting. Um, and uh, and then he, he, he decided not to do that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so it is kind of funny. It's almost like the original version of the story survives in, uh, in, in Smaug's dream, which is funny and I like it, but, um, uh, but, uh, but I, as, as I said, I've never been totally convinced of it. Um, anyway, okay. Just to give us some context of dreams there. So what we can see is that there are dreams. We have a, a tradition of significant dreams, Right. Um, and in two cases in The Hobbit, the dream with the bears and the dream with the goblins, Bilbo seems to dream a thing that is actually happening pretty much at the same time, right? He has sort of a vision in his dream of a relevant contemporaneous event. Um, the third one, the one, the other one, the one about his dream, it's not third, it's second technically, chronologically, but um, the one he has in the Eagle's Eyrie about looking around Bag End for something seems to be more symbolic, Right. Um, still significant, I would say, but more personal and symbolic rather than sort of dreaming about a thing that happens. So, OK, remembering dreams and how they work in The Hobbit. This is our first dream uh, in The Lord of the Rings. So now we're ready. When at last he had got to bed, Frodo could not sleep for some time. His legs ached. He was glad that he was riding in the morning. Eventually he fell into a vague dream, in which he seemed to be looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. Down below among the roots there was the sound of creatures crawling and snuffling. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest. Then he knew it was not leaves, but the sound of the sea far off, a sound he had never heard in waking life, though it had often troubled his dreams. Suddenly, he found he was out in the open. There were no trees, after all. He was on a dark heath, and there was a strange salt smell in the air. Looking up, he saw before him a tall white tower, standing alone on a high ridge. A great desire came over him to climb the tower and see the sea. He started to struggle up the ridge towards the tower, but suddenly a light came in the sky, and there was a noise of thunder. Okay. So, what do we think? So, first of all, let's let's make sure we're understanding what's going on here, right? There are two, three stages of the dream, right? The first is of him looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. So, we see him looking out over a forest, a dark sea of tangled trees. And down among the roots... There's the sound of creatures crawling and snuffling. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Okay, so that's part one. Looking over the tops of the forest, right, but hearing creatures snuffling around, creatures who are sniffing around and looking for him, right? That's part one. Now, that part seems... The snuffling seems pretty clear, right? Um, and, and the giveaway is that last line. He felt sure they would smell him out sooner or later. Well, we only know of one kind of creature, right, that is sniffing around and, and, and uh, 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 you know, uh, searching, right, for him. Remember our discussion of the word searching. Um, yeah, so Black Riders... Right. Um, now, the forest. I'm thinking... Okay, so there are a couple possibilities here. One is that he's dreaming of another forest, of a distant forest. Matt suggests Dol Guldur. It's possible that it could be Mirkwood. Of course, the dark sea of tangled trees sounds very Mirkwoodish, right? But I'm not sure. I think it's possible... Uh, I think it's possible that he is just thinking of the old forest, right? He, again, and JJ says he could be remembering Bilbo's stories about Mirkwood. He absolutely could. Remember, though, two out of the three dreams and the two chiefly um, uh, prophetic dreams 
uh, that we see in The Hobbit are dreams about things not happening in the future, but happening right then, right? And what's happening right then, what's going to be happening in the morning is them going out into the old forest. I'm inclined to think it's the old forest, especially since we know that the Black Riders are local, right? They're, they're, they're nearby. Uh, remember Frodo, like, having that sort of fear-induced vision of the walls disappearing and the, the Black Riders coming in on them right the night before? Uh, so... It's funny, you guys are all wanting to talk about the Tower and the Sea, and I'm not talking about the Tower and the Sea. You know why I'm not talking about the Tower and the Sea yet? Because every single time in my entire life that I have read this dream, I have focused only on the Tower and the Sea. And you know what? I think I completely missed that first paragraph. Like, I don't even think... If you had asked me, um, what does Frodo dream about in Crick Hollow? I would have been like, there's a Tower and the Sea, and he dreams about what... And I wouldn't even have remembered that first paragraph. But I think it's important, um, and I think it's uh, it's in order for us even to understand the significance of the tower and the sea, we have to understand its context, and this is the context. Frodo is having a dream about the sea. Now, notice he's not down in the forest, right? He's looking over the sea of trees, like anticipating their journey or something, right? He, so in his dream, he's like looking out over the way that they're going to go, right? Over the old forest. And he's fearful of the Black Riders snuffling around, right? Hunting for him in this dark forest. We've got the scariness of the dark forest itself. Dark sea of tangled trees. Sounds kind of threatening. And then you have, of course, um, among that, you've got Black Riders snuffling around. That's all terrifying, right? So, okay. Um, And in that context in the context of his fearful anticipation of the very serious danger, twofold danger, Forrest itself and the Black Riders, that he's heading off to at the break of day, in that context, he hears a noise in the distance. Right? And yes, Emma Thorne, he is looking out from a tower, ta- but he's not looking out from a tower yet. It's a, he, he, he is looking, he is looking out of a high window over a dark sea of tangled trees. I don't think that's a tower. It's explicitly not the tower that he sees before. Um, so I think that uh, com- uh, I- identifying the high window that Frodo describes him seeing out of at the beginning of his dream, identifying that with the tower, I think is incorrect, right? Because the tower appears as a separate thing, and he has to walk up and approach it. He's not in the tower. He never gets to the tower. He dreams about trying to get to the tower, but he never gets to the tower. And besides, what you see from that tower is not a a dark sea of tangled trees. You see the ocean. You see the sea from there, right? Um, A great desire came over him to climb the tower and see the sea, right? So, um, yeah, James says maybe he's dreaming of two-story houses. Exactly, right? Um, I think think the... um, Remember, high window is a relative term, right? What Frodo would consider a high window is maybe not what you and I would consider a high window. Um, it could A high window could merely be the window of a hobbit hole that's kind of up the hill, right? So we can see out over the forest below it. Um, so I'm not thinking tower there at all. Again, I'm thinking of him looking from, um, you know, from a vantage point you know, in the civilized Hobbit land where he is, you know, in Buckland or the Shire, like him looking from a, from a vaguely Shire-ish standpoint and looking out over the danger that lies ahead. Old Forest, Black Riders, right? And then that kind of, so this, what seems to be just like a fear anticipation nightmare, right? Uh, a nightmare about the thing that you've gone to sleep fearing, it shifts. Then he heard a noise in the distance. At first he thought it was a great wind coming over the leaves of the forest. So when he first hears the noise, he thinks it's a part of that same picture. The the forest. The dark forest, right? So he thinks this is a part of his fear dream. There is a wind in the trees. This dark forest, right? And then he realizes, no, it's not. It's not leaves. It's the sound of the sea far off. And then we get that fascinating fact a sound he had never heard in waking life, though it had often troubled his dreams. Frodo often dreams of the sound of the ocean. He's never been to the ocean, he's never heard the sea, but he often dreams uh, of the ocean. Okay, so 
that's interesting all by itself, right? So first we take the abstract fact. Frodo dreams about the ocean. Why does Frodo dream about the ocean? Well, there's, what, something of the sea longing? We know that that's true because that's where it goes, right? Um, suddenly he found he's out in the open. There were no trees after all. So first you get the sound, the intrusion of the sound, and it's the sound of the ocean that changes the dream, right? Changes it from the fear anticipation, looking forward over their 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 the danger that they're about to go into, right, to turning in the entire opposite direction. That even works geographically, right? Instead of looking east uh, into the fear and the shadow, he's now looking west across the sea, facing the tower. Um, there were no trees after all, right? That thing that he was afraid of, not even in the picture anymore. He was on a dark heath, which is interesting, too. A dark heath. Uh, a heath is a... It's open land, but it's not just open land. A heath is... Uh, remember the word heath is used in The Hobbit? In fact, it's used on Thor's map. Remember the withered heath where the dragons breed, right? Um, a heath, specifically, is a uh, countryside which has been destroyed. Like, when there's a fire, when there's a wildfire, and then just, like, rough brush grows afterwards, that's a heath, okay? Um... So a dark heath is a kind of an ominous sort of landscape to be in. Um, but he's near the sea. So he's going through the dark heath, and he sees a tall white tower alone on a high ridge in front of him. Very different. So it's the only bright thing in his entire dream. Right here, all this, you know, the dark sea of tangled trees, the dark heath that he's on, and then the tall white tower standing alone on a high ridge. Um, and he wants to climb the tower and see the sea. And he struggles up the ridge towards the tower, but he doesn't get to it. Right? Um, more on that in a second. The transformation of the dream seems to me a really, really important thing. Um, uh, it's, um, again, it starts off as just like an anxiety dream, which isn't even a prophetic anxiety dream. It's just an anxiety dream, right? The moment at which he begins to hear the sea, this seems to take, the dream seems to take on a new significance. Now, why does he dream of the sea habitually? So first we have the fact that he dreams of it habitually. Then we have the way in which it transforms his dream. It turns him away from the east to the west. It turns him away from darkness and fear to the white tower and the sea beyond. From fear to desire, right? Uh, from the fear of the snuffling creatures crawling and snuffling and smelling him out, right? To a great desire came over him to climb the tower and see the sea. Um, so, why does he dream of the sea? We don't know. I mean, we can't answer that question, right? Um, knowing what's going to happen eventually, it's interesting, right? Now, Several of you are wanting to identify the tower. Yes, there are towers like this in the Tower Hills out towards the ocean in the western part of the Shire. That is true. I have to say, I find that geographic fact, to me, it's like the least important thing about this dream. Um... You could say, well, that, you know, maybe the seed of this dream comes from the fact that he's heard about the fact that there are these elf towers out, you know, way out in the west uh, of the Shire towards the ocean. I mean, yeah, he probably has. But again, I don't think that that's what's important. You know, Julie, he's never seen the Tower Hills. Um, and I don't think it is a real tower. I don't think it needs to be a real tower. I think the symbolic significance of this tower is much more, Im much, much greater than its geographic significance. Um, uh, so, yeah, 
And yes, Lincoln, I, I, I agree. The similarity between this tower and the tower from Beowulf and the Critics, that's all I can think of. Well, not all I can think of, but I certainly am thinking of that too, Lincoln. Um, and there, of course, in Beowulf and the Critics, you know, in the Monsters and the Critics, the tower is explicitly an, an allegorical tower, right? It's a symbolic tower. Um, so, Carita, yes, that's a good way of saying it. Carita says, it's a symbol in a dream before it's a tower in a place. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, now, I don't consider the fact that it's likely a genuine geographical place that he's dreaming of, I don't consider that entirely, you know, useless information or utterly irrelevant. As I say, it's just to me much less important. Be- and less important because there's no outside significance of that, exactly. That is to say... It's not like he's dreaming of a thing that's happening out in, you know, Emin Berain right now. I mean, it's it's not, it's not, you know, this has nothing to do with the Tower Hills, right? There's no current event going on in the Tower Hills that he's dreaming of. Um, so again, the fact that this is really there, and it gives the dream a kind of authenticity, right? It gives it a kind of insight, which it wouldn't have if it were not, if there were not something real attached to it. But... Um, but I, uh, I, I don't think. That, but again, but that's why to me it's less important than the symbolic role that the tower plays uh, in the dream. Um, so I definitely, yeah, I don't think. Um, <clears throat> uh, now that's a great question, Matt. Matt asks, "Is there a tower like this in Valinor? There seems to be a struggle between two powers." Uh, you know, and feels like it's a part of the dream, right? That East versus West thing, Matt, and the you know the the uh, the fear versus desire, the um, you know darkness versus light. Yeah, we certainly do see that kind of thing going on. And Matt, the way that the the dream of the of the sea seems to almost intervene in a comforting way, right? Um, as Frodo is at risk, maybe, of being paralyzed by fear, as Gildor was concerned about. He, at that moment, hears the sound um, of the sea, uh, and the dream shifts from a dream of fear to a dream of desire. Yeah, no, that doesn't seem coincidental to me at all. Um, We don't know where Bilbo's dreams come from, right? We're given no mechanism for that we're led to understand, I mean, I think we have every reason to understand that they're significant dreams in The Hobbit, but we don't know why or any backstory of them, right? Um, but <clears throat> knowing the Silmarillion, even the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion, which is all Tolkien had at this point, um, I think we can make a pretty good stab at this dream, right? Uh, so a traveler next to a large river has a dream about the ocean. <laughs> Sound like anybody we know, right? Uh, any Anybody on your suspect list there? Yeah, exactly. Sounds like Olmo to me. I absolutely agree. Um, this is just the kind of stuff that Olmo pulls all the time, right? Sending dreams to people next to rivers, right? Anywhere where the where the where the waters of Middle Earth flow through. Uh, it's totally his mo, Julia. Absolutely. Um, Exactly, Tony. Like the dream that Finrod and Turgon uh, have, like the desire that arises in Tuor's heart and messages that he receives and stuff. Yeah, no, I. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's the kind of thing that that uh, that 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 Olmo does. But I agree, JJ. And JJ says so. Frodo's being told to go to Gondolin. Well, it is different, right? Very different. It's different from the messages that were given to 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 Finrod and Turgon. It's different from the the message that's given to Tuor, right? And the 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 the, the doom that's laid upon Tuor. Um, but um, uh, but it. Uh, oh, Ambrosius, you were mentioning Tuor before. Sorry, I I I, I missed that. But absolutely. Um, yeah, if Finn does point out, well, he does have that uh, quest to go to Mordor, right? He does have a doom, a heavy doom that's laid upon him. We don't see Olmo as chiefly in the business of just handing out hope, right? Well, except we kind of do, right? Now, for a second, if you can, forget the published Silmarillion. 
And think back, those of you who've been doing Mythgard Academy with me, think back to the earlier Silmarillion stuff. Think back to the encounter between Tuor and Ulmo as we got it in, like, the 1930 Quentin Older Inwa, or the 1937 Quenta Silmarillion. Um, Ulmo is the one who is preserving hope for the Noldor after they've been crushed by Morgoth in the near Nyth Arnoidiad, which wasn't called that yet. Um, but anyway, after the Battle of Unnumbered Tears, uh, when the Noldor were crushed and almost all of them were enslaved, and only in Gondolin did any of the free Noldor still survive. Again, this is the older version of the story now, not the published Silmarillion. Um, Olmo is in the business of hope, right? He is, in, he is the one who has not abandoned uh, the people of Middle-earth and who comes to help them and to give them hope. So, you know... Um, uh, this seems to me very, very like Exactly. Tony Mead was just pointing out that we're told that Olmo is the one who never forgets about Middle-earth and speaks to the people there more than any of the other Valar. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so, yeah. I, 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 you know, it's not absolutely open and shut. We're not told explicitly. Um, but under the circumstances, right, it does seem to me likely that this is Olmo uh, speaking to Frodo, that this is him sending a vision of hope. Um, and it is, you know, so Matt, whether the tower is the Tower Hills, or what What about this? Again, I can see, I get to me the geography is not to me what's very significant. What if Frodo doubtless has heard stories of the elf towers, right? That's what the hobbits seem to call them, um, out in the west, right by the sea, um, what if, having heard those stories, uh, Frodo is, uh, his mind is sort of constructing an image based of those stories, but it's not one of those towers that he's seeing. It is a Valinorian tower, or maybe it's a tower in Tol Arisea. Um, it'd actually be almost cooler, right, if instead of turning west, we're not told the direction, right? Um, we're just told that he's seeing the sea. Um, so notice I was assuming that he's turning from the east and now he's facing the west, which is kind of cool in the whole light, darkness, fear, desire, 180 degree turnaround thing. Um, uh, kind of works, but it's almost cooler, right? If, in, if he's still facing east, but now whoosh, he's facing east from the other side of the sea, right? And see, uh, that's actually kind of fun, uh, because that would be a preview of the view, in fact, that Frodo is actually going to get, uh, right later on, uh, in his life, um, uh, so I don't know. Um, uh, now, now, Matt points out, of course, we have heard that Frodo is dreaming about mountains, right? Um, we, we haven't. This is the first time we've gotten his dream narrated, but it is not the first reference we have to his dreaming. He does dream about mountains, right? Um, so, uh, um, yeah, Matt says, uh, part of the reason I asked about Valinor is that Frodo's been dreaming about mountains, which sounds like Mordor to me. He has never seen, uh, mountains he has never seen back at the time when Sauron is calling all dark things and the ring to him. It sounds like the time when Ulmo or others might intervene. I, quite likely. Um, and if so, Matt, it does, that certainly does hold together with the idea that this is a dream of hope responding to the fear, right? Uh, the fear in which his dream begins. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> Oakwig is suggesting that this shows that Frodo is the sleeper in the Tower of Pearl. Oh, yeah, I love it. Um, if you don't know who the sleeper in the Tower of Pearl is, don't worry about it. Nobody knows who the sleeper in the Tower of Pearl is. It's just one of those things that Tolkien refers to in some of his earlier stories, and he never really tells the story of the sleeper in the Tower of Pearl. Um, but that phrase, it's one of those things, Tolkien had such a gift for making names or phrases that are like a whole myth all by themselves, right? I don't need the story of the sleeper in the Tower of Pearl. It's enough for me, right? Just the name, just like, you know, I think about, you know, how C.S. Lewis marveled at the title of, uh, of, uh, um, of, uh, Morris, 
forgetting his name, William Morris's book, The Well at the World's End, right? He's like, the, the title is a myth in itself. Uh, what story could possibly live up to that title, uh, C.S. Lewis says. Um, I find so many of Tolkien's phrases to have a similar kind of, and he's certainly right, right? I mean, The Well at the World's End has got to be one of the greatest book titles of all time. But anyway, um, I, I find that so many of, of Tolkien's titles and names and things work the same way. And for me, The Sleeper in the Tower of Pearl uh, has always been uh, a great example of one of those things. Again, it's like that name is like a story all, all, all in itself. Um, okay, so yeah, yeah. See, um, I, I, I don't know how to pronounce your name, Ivinian. Um, I'm. This is why I, I don't think you were suggesting that the tower was made of ivory. I'm not sure that it is. It's a tall white tower. Um, and again, thinking in Tolkien's mythology, we have a precedent for towers of pearl, but I don't recall towers of ivory. Um, I might be wrong. If anybody can remember a tower of ivory in Tolkien's mythology, remind me of it. But I don't remember one. I do remember towers of pearl, however. Um, so that strikes me as very likely what... Um, uh, what that means. Ambrosius Aureliana says that uh, he's, he likes Lewis's own Out of the Silent Planet for the same reason. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't hit quite as hard, quite as deeply, but I, I always have loved that title as well. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. Um, Yeah, <laughs> Druid's Fire is teasing me. I'm not saying that it was Olmo, but it's Olmo. Yeah, pretty much. That's that's uh, that's pretty much the way of it, Druid's Fire. Um, okay, all right. So, so this was fun, right? So I think, therefore, that what we're seeing in this dream, this is not a dream with the kind of significance that we might have first thought, right, looking from The Hobbit. This doesn't seem to be one of those sort of visionary insight dreams, right? Where you're given a vision of something that's happening um, like Bilbo was in the Goblin's Cave and uh, and at Bjorn's house. Um, it's uh, it's a, a different and I think more fully uh, symbolic kind. Ooh, one last detail, because there's so much in this dream. I love his struggling up the ridge towards the tower, right? Frodo's, that's the one place in this dream where Frodo's will is engaged. He's a passive observer everywhere else, right? The only action, the only thing he does in the dream before that is interpret the sound, right? He hears the sound and he thinks it's the wind in the trees and then he realizes, no, it's the, it's the sea, right? That act of recognition, that act of interpretation is the only thing he does in the dream until the end. At the end... He's walking towards the tower, right? Frodo chooses the tower and not the wood. He chooses desire instead of fear. And uh, we see him, and it's not an easy walk. He's not strolling, right? He's trudging across the dark heath, um, uh, struggling up the ridge towards the tower. It's hard work, right? But he wants to get uh, to the tower. And that seems to be... So, in a sense, you could say that both halves of the dream are of the same thing. In a sense, he's getting a vision of his mission, of his do, of his future life, right? The first view is one which is fear and darkness, right? You are going off into darkness. You are dropping off the map. Um, you're going into this dark and tangled sea of trees with uh, horrible, nasty creatures crawling and snuffling around, hunting for you inside it, right? This is your life. Yes, sure, it is, that's true, but this is also your life. Your life is also struggling up the ridge towards the tower and climbing that gleaming white tower and uh, being able to see the sea, right? Um, following your desire towards that final goal, which will be climbing up a tower and seeing the sea. Um, that's also his life, right? And he chooses that. And I think that's really cool. And I agree that Twitter comment that just came up just now, it is more, and, and clearly throughout this, is comfort from the Valar. Again, I would I would, I would, would call Ulmo specifically, um, but uh, Issa, yeah, I totally agree with that. That seems to me the most important work that's being done here 
you can, again, you can see it as a vision of his life, but it's not like it's a very detailed piece of insight into his life, right? Uh, it's not like he's going to gain much data about his future life from this. Um, really, it's about his outlook, uh, his anticipation of his life to come, and this message of hope that he's given, which uh, shifts the focus, right? Uh, which changes the picture for him. It doesn't change the facts, but it changes the whole orientation uh, of his relationship to it. So um, so that's cool. Uh, Julia says the first part is in the immediate future, the next part is farther in the future. Julia, I'm not sure that that's not saying exactly the same thing as I just said, right? In a sense, do you see what I mean? Right, that is, yeah, like, tomorrow is going to be scary. <laughs> and you know what? The next day after that, scary too, right? You're going to have to pass through darkness. Um, but big picture, longer view, right? In the end, we're looking at the sea from a tower, right? That's where this journey is ultimately headed. Keep your view on that, uh, and you'll worry less about the dark forest through which you've got to go head tomorrow. Um, yeah, yeah, good. Okay, um, cool. All right, so, um, let's, um, let's start chapter six, shall we? I'm not going to get anywhere close to where I wanted to get tonight, but it was totally worth it, right? We just spent, like, what did we just spend? We just spent, like, half an hour talking about Frodo's dream, which was awesome, right? So, uh, I don't regret it even a little bit. Um, but um, but let's uh, let's keep going. Let's at least start chapter six. Shall we start chapter six? Let's start chapter six. Let's start chapter six because it gives me an excuse to go back and talk about the dream more. Tongo was just asking about the thunder. Ah, see, we hadn't gotten to the thunder yet. Hang on. So let's let's wait. That that that, that was a little hasty, right? Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, look at the end. A great desire came over him to climb the tower and see the sea. He started to struggle up the ridge towards the tower, but suddenly a light came in the sky and there was a noise of thunder. Now let's stop for a second. A light came in the sky and there was a noise of thunder. Now, a light coming in the sky, especially in the context of the tower and the sea, right, and all that stuff, um sounds like Varda, right? Uh, you know, it sounds like we're, 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 we're talking about, again, if we're thinking about the intervention of the Valar here, right? And a light coming in the sky and the noise of thunder. So we've got Varda and Manway here, um, uh, you know, interjecting into the dream. It sounds a little ominous. The noise of thunder sounds a little ominous, but it needn't necessarily be very ominous. Um, but anyway, yeah, Varda and Manway kind of seems like maybe we're getting a glimpse, right, of uh, of 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 the the you know that they're looking over this, right? The sudden light the sudden light comes into the sky doesn't sound too bad, right? If the, even if the sun, the thunder maybe sounds a little bit ominous. Um, yeah, Julia says it's starting to sound like a group effort on the Valar's part. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Um, but wait a second. Do you notice what happens at the beginning of the next chapter? Frodo woke suddenly. It was still dark in the room. Mary was standing there with a candle in one hand and banging on the door with the other. All right, what is it? said Frodo, still shaken and bewildered. You see what happened? Why is there a light and a sound of thunder? at the end of his dream. Mary's knocking on the door with a candle in his hand. He's not on the other side of the door, right? Mary is standing there, banging on the door, right? So Mary has opened the door, holding a candle in, which, in Frodo's eyes, right? And banging on the door just to make noise to wake him up, right? Exactly. The knocking and the candle are the light and the... Th or the well, the, the candle and the knocking are the light and the thunder, that interrupt Frodo's dream, right? So, on the, so what we have is a really fascinating transitional moment, right? Where uh, the light coming in the sky and the noise of thunder, on the one hand, sounds like the most like dramatically portentous moment in the dream, 
right? Especially since it culminates it. I mean, when the dream ends with a flash of light and a noise of thunder, um, that's pretty that's pretty dramatic, right? Um, but of course, it turns out also to be mundane. It's Mary's candle and his hand knocking on the door, right? I love that transition. Now, again, do I think that that undermines the more sort of significant and portentous um, uh, sense of that, like that Varda and Manway intervention kind of feeling that you get there at the end of the dream? No, I don't think it... Uh, uh, I don't think it undermines that at all. I don't think it uh, it makes that impossible. The two of them kind of merge together. Just because we're given a mundane explanation for why he started dreaming of thunder doesn't mean that the thunder in his dream isn't significant, right? Um, I, exactly, Tungo. I think I, I do think it is both. Um, but uh, but that's fun, right? I love that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, yeah, very good. Um, Frodo is still shaken and bewildered, of course, as he comes out of his dream, which is interesting. Shake, uh, he's both shaken and bewildered. I'm always bewildered when I wake up, uh, especially if I'm woken up very early in the morning. Um, but, um, uh, but he's still shaken is, is, is to me kind of interesting. Um, he's been shaken up. It's been a, it was the, his dream was clearly a fairly profound emotional experience. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> John Osclaw says that he's been bothered as well. Probably a, a bit be bothered. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, Okay, what is it? cried Mary. It's time to get up. It is half past four and very foggy. Come on. Sam is already getting breakfast ready. Even Pippin is up. I am just going to saddle the ponies and fetch the one that is to be the baggage carrier. Wake that sluggard fatty. At least he must get up and see us off. Okay. Um, even Pippin is up. So notice what we get here. We do get a little bit more information about Frodo's dream here. Um, Frodo has overslept everybody. Even Pippin is up is a pretty serious indictment, right? Uh, uh, and of course, you know he's teasing. Uh, he's 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 teasing Pippin. But um, uh, but the fa I think the fact that Frodo was sleeping so deeply, right? Uh, and uh, uh, and was so comparatively difficult to wake up, uh, does, does I think, help to kind of undermine, or not undermine, underscore is what I meant to say, um, the, uh, the level of immersion, right, that Frodo had uh, in, that, in that dream. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Matt, I agree. I think that's really neat. Uh, Matt points out how <clears throat> uh, he's he's shaken. You know, just like you would shake somebody to wake them. Mary didn't shake him, right? But he's feeling shaken. Uh, and it's foggy out, uh, as is the bewildered Frodo. Yeah, Frodo is feeling pretty foggy uh, himself as well, right? Uh, and uh, we find that it's, uh, that it's going to be... Uh, uh, it's that it's very foggy outside. So yeah, the way that that matches is really, uh, is really fun. Um... Okay. <laughs> so here's my dilemma. It's 11 o'clock. Now, 11 o'clock is normally when I would transition to doing uh, our field trip. Um, and I want to transition to doing our field trip. But here's the thing. I was totally planning on getting more than two slides into the into our book discussion tonight. I really did plan to get into the old forest here this evening. Uh, and that's why, I'm, so my plan was to do the, to do our field trip in the old forest. Uh, and uh, we kind of haven't gotten to that at all. Um, so now I'm trying to decide a couple, so I've got a couple different things. All right, thing number one. 
Option number one. We stop our book discussion here and pick up with this and go into the Old Forest next week, which would be totally fine. But we could do a f- we could do the field trip. Um, but I kind of don't want to do the field trip to the Old Forest like I was planning on. Um, if we haven't since we haven't talked about the Old Forest yet, like I was, we were going to go to Bonfire Glade and the Bald Hill, uh, which are the two things that I was hoping we would get to or get near to uh, in tonight's discussion, and then we didn't at all. Um, so um, the other option would be to. See, I don't think I... I'm tempted to be like, well, let's keep going on and we'll do a few more slides and then we'll get into the old forest. But we're not we're not going to be able to get to all the things that I want to get to. Um, so, uh... <laughs> let's go visit Maggot again, again, says Finn. Um, yeah, we can't travel into Frodo's dream. Hey, Trish, can you think of anywhere... Uh, any, any, any towers of pearl we could visit? Any places we can... So I'm trying to think if there's a if there's a tower by the sea related field trip that we could spontaneously do, because that's kind of what I'm thinking. If I didn't want to do a field trip right now, based on tonight's class, I would totally want to be looking for white towers. Um, Kellendim Hologrow, yeah, I was kind of thinking about that. I've been kind of saving Kellendim for later on, but we could do... We could go visit the Belfalus Homesteads. I mean, different set of towers, of course. Um, oh, yeah, you were suggesting Kel and Dim. Trish, okay. There is a tower by the lake in Enuminous, but it, that's very different. That's very different. Finn wants to go to Barad-Dur. Wait for it. Um, oh, your mic stopped working entirely, Trish? Oh, dear. Um, let's see. Can you hear me? Oh, can, can hear me. Can hear you now. Okay, sorry. I can hear, you can hear me. Oh, I could. Hang on. Weird. Okay, got you again. Oh, so they probably heard me earlier tonight when I was interrupting, trying to interrupt you. <laughs> <laughs> probably. I didn't know. <laughs> when, you, when you were first doing the announcements, you said you were on Twitch. Uh, you, you meant to say Twitter Live, and you said Twitch Live. And oh, I was, try, I was, well, gonna, I was yeah. trying to say Twitter Live. Twitter Live, yeah, right. Finally figured it out. Of course, I Twitch was on there. Twitch Live, too. So, you know, that's, that's fine. Yeah, you were just like you. Yeah. So I was going to say Kellendam, I mean, because that's the best ocean. To, well, Belfalas Housing. Uh, we could go to the Belfalas housing where the islands are. Remember, we've several people we suggest. Why there. not? Let's go. Because Let's go. there's a housing broker right at the Boar Fountain, and all we right. got to do is decide which housing development we want to go into. Yeah, we all go in there together, and we can run around in there. And there's definitely towers and islands and all kinds of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Let's go there again. It's like you know, it's it's highly unlikely that those those are the white towers of which Frodo was dreaming. Um, but hey, I agree. That's that. That's a white tower. We can do that. Okay, let's do that. Let's do it. Cool. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Um, and s- several people were suggesting that. Druid's Fire was suggesting that. And uh, yeah, and if anybody, I don't know if anybody with us here has a house. You know, if anybody has a house in one of those, let us know the neighborhood. Um, yeah. To where your house is, if you want. Yeah. So I'm gonna actually I'm gonna go. So we are gonna shift to the field trip. Then we'll pick up here at the. So see, we did do chapter six because we totally did the first two paragraphs of chapter six. So there we go. Um, so I'm gonna switch to to in game field trip. So I'm gonna sign off uh, Twitter live because let's face it, watching me as I play the game, which nobody can see on Twitter, is not gonna be very entertaining. Uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna say goodbye to the folks on Twitter. Uh, you can still join us at twitch.tv slash signumu and uh, watch along with us as we do the in-game field trip. Um, but I'm going to say thanks for joining us to everybody on Twitter, and I will be back with Twitter next week. Okay. All right. So I stopped the Twitter broadcast, but now we're still going on here. All right. Good. So So if, if anybody wants to vote for a particular housing uh, 
development housing yes. neighborhood, send me a tell, M A E V E N N, um, and I'll let everybody know. Otherwise, uh, well, let's convene at the Boar Fountain where the housing broker is, and we'll figure out where we're going to go. Cool. All right, let's do that. So we're heading out to the, for those of you who don't play the game, the Boar Fountain is a, uh, um, oh man, sorry. I'm, uh, I'm still getting used to, so I, I have my cast off, but I still have a splint on my finger. So in some ways it's like actually kind of stranger to try to navigate with this because I can almost navigate normally, but not quite. Whereas when I had the cast, I didn't even try. So I'm struggling here, but we'll see what we can do. Okay. Anyway, so yeah, the boar fountain, the, uh, the, the, in, in the game, they describe how the boar is sort of taken as the symbol of Brie. Um, oh, yeah, here we go. Uh, call up Signal View there. That's good. And let's mount the horse too. Okay. Excellent. Uh, lagging a little bit there. Okay. All right. So we're heading back down the Scholar Stair. We'll head up past the Prancing Pony. Up the hill. And there's the pony at the top of the hill. What a huge place that is. Look at that. Counting those little tower things, that's four stories. How big that must look to hobbits coming out of the Shire. And now we go down to the center of town, where everybody else already is, by the big fountain with the boars. Okay. So where are we going? Okay. Well, I we can just pick we can just pick one. Um, we have some houses open for us to look at. We can always go into one of the houses. <laughs> so, do I click on Homesteads of Gondor? Yes, click on Homesteads of Gondor, Hello, and that should friend. open up Belfalas Homesteads. Uh, oh, wait a second, Homesteads of Gondor. I think that's a that's it's a, a quest. Visit the Cape. Well, that's fine. We can okay. do that. Yeah. If everybody can do it, because that'll put us in like you know, like at the gate okay. of one of the um, things, and I think uh, it's quest oh, level ninety. For but I guess it's, it probably rolls up to whoever. Anyway, yeah, let's do that. Okay. Um, oh wait, this is I'm I'm, I'm getting the house purchase oh, interface. But, yeah. Okay. So never mind. Okay. So so we need to do the neighborhood. I would say we could pick like the first one if you want, or pick one maybe like. Greg lad that's got more houses available if you feel like going to any of the houses. Um, Are you looking for something? B-R-A-I-G-L-A-D. Greg lad, okay. Um, oh. can we tour it? Um, oh, here we go. Druid's Fire. It's uh, open to the public. Gilranan neighborhood. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. Gilranan. So G-I-L-R-A-N-N-O-N. Okay. And um, I would say what you do is let's pick that house that's th that says one, uh, you know, uh, oh, okay, no, pick pick one Cypress Road, which is the very first one. Okay. Tour and house. Then hit, hit, and then click tour house, and we'll all show up right at the <laughs> entrance. Okay. Uh, all right. Then tour the house. And then Belwina, who... Okay, so is it Bailwina's house? I have tall, tall, long, in the neighborhood. It's open to the public. And I believe that is, isn't that an island, I believe? Um, anyway, so, well, one of the things we could do is basically turn, get up here, maybe, and have a look out over the water. And there are definitely towers around here. Okay, let's see. So just to make sure everybody knows where we are, we're in the Cape of Belfalas here. Okay, so here we are over here, the Havens of Belfalas. So let's go out a little bit more, right? So here we are down by Dol Amroth, right, and by Lamadon. If we go out even further, so right here we are down here in the Bay of Belfalas. And the here's Minas Tirith and Osgiliath and stuff. So we're way down in the bay, uh, further south than the narrative ever goes. Okay, sorry. Where are we going? Over here. Now we have two options. Tol Lakul, if you look on your map, is open to the public. That's Druid's Fire's house. 
Oh, great. Uh, we can take a boat over there. And also, if you look down at the very huh. tip, Nar- Narvinden, that's like a big lighthouse. Right. So that's pretty close to a tower, right? Right. <laughs> okay. So we, those are two places we can go. Okay, cool. 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 Well, let's uh, let's go to both places. I wish we could. Of course, it's nighttime. It always is when I don't want it to of be. Of course. I mean, of we course, you know. It's until four dawn. We'll get to see the sunrise. Oh, it's the way it watches, so that's fine. Yeah. Oh, you can just barely see the horizon is like getting pink, right? Just barely. Right. Uh, okay. Cool. Um, all right. So we'll see the dawn. That'll be nice. You can just see the gulls out over the sea there. Alas for the gulls, Legolas would say. Okay, cool. So yeah, so let's uh, let's let's go. We can't see very much from here, but yeah. Remember how the gulls are attached, are connected to the sea longing in Legolas's case in particular, right? That whenever he hears, you know, as uh, Galadriel predicts, whenever he hears the gulls, the sound of the gulls, that he will never, uh, his heart will will rest in the forest no more. Um, so that's an interesting connection with this, uh, with the sea longing, which of course has a totally different sense for Legolas than it has for Frodo. Uh, but cool. Okay. All right. Show me some fancy houses that I that I don't have access to. <laughs> Did I hear somebody crying? It's weird. Sounds like someone's um, crying. Yeah. So come on down to the main road. I'm just sitting down here on my horse at the main road from where y'all are. And uh, we'll go down to where the ferry boats are. You know, we can take a boat across to the to the island. On this way, okay. All right. So where are we going? Down this way. We can take the ferry. Yeah, we'll take a boat over. Okay. Who's this guy? A little Gondorian soldier here. I can't click on him. He's got the white shield there. Oh, oh so we're looking for Phoenix. Let me let me actually notice his fellow with Phoenix. So I can, his armor just has the is. stars and not the anything else. Just the seven stars. That's interesting. With a very Numenorean <laughs> star on top. Sorry, so, sorry. So I got to, oh, okay. I got lost. Phoenix. Phoenix is waiting for us on her island. It's Druid's Fire. So, Excellent. Um, so she will be our hostess. Wait, so where are we going? We're going to the, this. We're coming down to where the boats Ooh. are, which I believe is. This is not a boat. I'm just trying to find it. This is a. I'm trying to find where the boats well, are. Look at this. Little children dancing. they are just kind of hanging out. Little Gondorian. Does Pineleaf know where he's going? Play along here. Sorry. Sorry. Getting distracted. Oh, Here I okay. come. No, no. Be distracted. It's fine. It's, yeah. it's very interesting. It's only the second time I've ever been here. So this is where the, the boats are down here. And we're going to the... You take the boat that goes to Tol Lakul. Lakul? Lakul. Lakul. Okay. So um, check before you go. Right. Don't want to get in the wrong boat wrong one so we go to the next pier over oh this isn't it no next pier both bo both goes to go to the, both goats boats go to the same place so come over to the next pier and this should be it here yep no this not here what's here though what is she an auctioneer oh, look at that just a random auction here hanging out. That's nice. Got some. Okay, yeah, we got some. A forge master here. That's nice. <laughs> oh, and a little open air pub. How quaint. That's great. Sorry. Um, <laughs> right. Next one over, you say, though. Next one over. Next yeah. one over, right? Okay. So the furthest from the furthest pier from the main market area there. The furthest pier. 
Okay. Cathlon, is it? I'm coming to get you. <laughs> yeah, I'm totally lost. Okay. So hey, look, see. it's another family dancing. I'm wait, hang on. Where are we here? There you are. Here I am. Okay, I'm coming. There I you found are. it. Okay. I found it. Okay. This is it. All right. We probably should have. We probably should have followed up, but you know. So just oh. click on one of these boats, and it'll take you over. I just click on a boat, huh? Okay. Yeah. See, it should always be that easy, given your seasickness. Wouldn't you, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, it like sounds Just pretty boom. awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I would not object. Oh, I love the little sheltered area at the back. Oh, that's very, that's very nice. Okay. Okay. So is this a kin house? All right. Here we are. I finally made it. Lovely. The radio, radio free Gallifrey. <laughs> oh, there's a terebinth tree in the yard. But I have a question. Is it pungent? That's the important question about the terebinth tree. How pungent, in fact, is this terebinth? Would you call it very pungent or only slightly pungent? That's really sorry. That's one of the phrases that always. Uh, I think both of those words, both the noun terebinth and the adjective pungent, were both new to me when I read The Lord of the Rings. So I remember as a child just rolling that phrase in the two towers. It's part of that description of Ithilien um, uh, when Sam identifies the pungent terebinth. And I just like that phrase. Uh, I must have, like, mouthed that word to myself for days after first reading it, the pungent terebinth, and I had no idea what that was. Um, uh, but, uh, but anyway, I've always, uh, I've always loved that. So, uh, 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 Druid's Fire, glad you guys have a, have a, have a terebinth. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, and I say, I, I think it's probably pretty pungent. Uh, so, so that's good. I think you've got a high quality, uh, a, a, a high pungency rating uh, on this terebinth tree there, so that's good. Um, this is a nice little terrace, so you can put, like, yard decorations all over here, right? Hey, it's a dwarf well! Can you jump down it? Yes, you just don't go that far, huh? Look, I threw myself in the well! That's fun. I don't have one of those. Little old man Willow. That's cute. That's really adorable. They should call it Young Man Willow. That would be even cuter. Uh, oh, it looks like a Yule Festival thing. I'm gonna snowman. Oh dear. Okay. Sorry, I'm just looking around. <laughs> When's it going to be done? I want to appreciate the Bay of Belfalus and all of its splendor. Okay. Hey, Harwick Banner. I've been to Harwick. Okay. Now, let's see. Your kin house here. Nice mailbox. What is that mailbox from? 
Is it like a Gondorian style mailbox or what? Must be, I guess. I don't know if you customize the mailbox. I like how the uh, the swan motif. It's the usual Gondorian mailbox. Okay. Okay. Um, I like that. So these are the swan wings, right on the door. We got the general swan wing thing going on, and all the architecture here, like the gold swan wings and the towers and stuff. Um, notice how it's like the. If uh, if you guys recall from Enuminous, right, when we were in Even Dim, their towers had those, all of the pointy bits sticking up on the top, and they've taken the same pointy bits on the top of towers motif, sorry to use all this technical language, and, uh, <laughs> uh, and they've, you know, integrated it with the swan wings, right, so that's really cool. But notice we still have the Numenorean symbol exactly like we see it in Enuminous, right, with this, uh, with the ship and star here, right? So you've got the sort of stylized crescent-shaped ship with the uh, with the two sails. I love how the the shaft of light coming down from the star um, to illuminate the way to Numenor uh, becomes the mast of the ship. Really, really neat uh, symbol that they've developed there. Uh, though set about as we can see with these shields which have what looks like the tree in it, right? So we get the tree, the ship, the star, and the swan wings for Do Amroth. Very cool. But sorry, uh, that was me going in the door. Oh, hey! You guys have a stone of a wreck in your yard over here. Very cool. Yeah, even the miniature stone of Erek is pretty big. Really hard to imagine Isildur bringing one of those puppies with him, but all right, let's go in. Okay, sorry. Yeah, you know, I was kind of going in before, and then I faked you out. Okay, got some maps. That's nice. That's good. Small fire pit. A turn back sign. Nice. Oh, the boots! Yeah! The danger sign, that's good. I got some nice, uh, nice welcome. I love the map room here at the beginning, that's cool. Oh, yeah, and the destroyed. Is that a destroyed model of Minas Tirith or a model of destroyed Minas Tirith? Oh, dear, yeah, it's been wrecked. A model of the white city that has been destroyed by the withered tree. Okay. I don't fully understand that, but I think I will. That will probably make more sense whenever I do whatever quest it was that leads to it. Cool. Oh, did you guys paint the stars on the roof, or does it come that way? I like the starry, the starry ceilings. Pretty sure it comes that way. Cool. Cool, except now I've turned around so many times I forget which door I came in. Oh well. Oh, we just wander around randomly here. Do -do 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 -do. Ah, uh, the Night and Stars Tapestry. Yes, this one is in the lore hall. Just love the ceiling. Oh, courtyard, huh? Oh, I see. Glass ceiling. Can you put yard things in here? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. So you have an opportunity to put indoor yard furniture. Right. Yeah, like our treacherous hole could go in there. <laughs> right. 
because those are so convenient. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Jace, I love the banner of the the banner of the past of the dead. I saw that briefly. Of course, now I've lost my way and I won't be able to find it back again. Where's the banner of the past of the dead? I did notice that in passing. I think it was out in the front, wasn't it? Yeah, except I don't remember which way the front was now. Here it is. It all comes of like turning myself in like circles too many me. times. Uh -huh. Yeah, Druids, I have mine like floating out in the middle of the room. And oh, yeah, else. there it is. <laughs> Very ghostly. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Ooh, so their banner is a. Hey, where'd it go? <laughs> oh. It's up higher. Okay. So their banner is a mountain with the sun behind it. Okay. Yeah, because it's the people of the mountain, so... All right. So this shows... That's interesting because it suggests, therefore, that their the banner that they have, that's their pre... Uh, pre-Sauron influence banner. So this is not the banner of servants of the enemy per se, um, but uh, but it's um, hey, who keeps moving the treasure, the banner? Uh, <laughs> it's 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 not you know it's it's it sort of shows their roots before they converted to the worship of Sauron and before they uh, you know before of course they would have broken their oath to Isildur which is interesting uh, being that it's like the Oathbreaker's banner so that's kind of that's kind of cool it's kind of fun neat okay cool is it done yet can we go back outside I want to look around the bay. I need to see what's on top of the island? Okay, Simon says I need to see what's on top of the island. Okay, let's go look around. the wrong button with my bad hand here. Okay. Aha! Wow. Wow. Okay, so down... Uh, down by the entrance we saw a sudden tree and now we're seeing a standing stone right uh, which uh, a minute ago Simon none had glimpsed but you alone right um, wow that is curious I agree with the text description that certainly is a curious standing stone. Um, this is what you get if you do, um, if you complete the anniversary scavenger hunt, all 10, you know, not one of each year for all 10. Hmm. Wow. The orbiting stones are really interesting. Yeah, I know it's the Standing Stones game symbol. Um, that's, of course... Yeah, so they, they're, they're clever. They've got their logo now, like, spread all around the world. <laughs> yeah, that is clever. Well, of course, it was a cleverly chosen logo for that reason. You know, yeah. not... Not something trademarked and distinctly Tolkienian, but something obviously very, uh, 
prominent, you know, in several important episodes, and even a song, as I said. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's fun. Cool. And yes, Phoenix, you're right. Versed in yesteryear is a pretty awesome title. I can agree with that. That is a pretty awesome title. Okay, so which island am I looking to there? I'm looking to Tol Falthu. Falthui here? Tall found the way? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, and that tower over there. Yeah. Is that a lighthouse? Looks like it. Yeah, that must be this lighthouse here. In the bay. And again, we're pretty much here, right? Yes. The sun is rising. Hooray! Belfales is a really interesting place. Um, I think it was a really fascinating choice for them. So, for those of you who don't play the game, this place where we are, the housing development here that you see the map of that we were uh, finding our way down, this is uh, sort of premier housing. You can get your own in-game house, and this is a kinship house here um, uh, in the game, so you can have you know a place where you can keep stuff and you can decorate it, and it's fun. Um, they just opened this housing relatively recently. It was one of the more recent things they did. Um, and the, you know, the idea of having Belfalus be the location of this, uh, this sort of premier housing is uh, really interesting. Um, because, of course, Belfalus is... It's associated with the sea. It's associated with the, with the place that the, uh, the wood elves go to depart from. You know, they have havens down here, so there are elf havens here where the elves depart from Middle-earth. Um, where the elves of the woodlands depart from, from Middle-earth. They don't cross over the mountains and go out to the Grey Havens. They come down in the south and leave from the sea. Uh, so it's this sort of trans it's this place of peace, but also this kind of place of of of, of trans it's this place of endings, right? Um, where the kingdom of Gondor's southern border lies and where uh, you know where the elves go to depart from Middle Earth. Uh, so I always found Belfalus a very interesting um, sort of name and place. And uh, I, I think that their their choice to to make housing down here was a really was a really fun and interesting one. Okay, we're finally able to see the land here around round about a little bit more. Cool. Okay, here we're looking south. So we're looking out again down into the bay here. Yeah, so we're looking down. We're around up in here, I think, right? And we're heading, we're staring down across the bay into the south. Cool. That's why you can see no real non watery horizon off in that direction. Yes, 
Druid's Fire, the music is extremely soothing here uh, in Belfalas. Um Yeah. And again, I find it so cool and so fitting. Notice the house. Yeah. It fronts the south, right? You're staring southeast, right? Staring uh, staring out out to sea, out into the ocean, or out into the bay, anyway. Um, yeah, so that you've got the, you're sort of invoking the sea longing, right? So this isn't exactly like the tower, of course, that Frodo was seeing that brought him hope, but, uh, But again, you think about Legolas and the gulls. Um, and, you know, he says, alas for the gulls, right? Because for him, it's it's a parting, right? Whereas with Frodo, uh, the vision of the sea is a vision of desire, right? Against, you know, the poised up against his fear. Uh, for Legolas, it's about loss. It's about desire, right? But it's about loss. And it's interesting that Frodo doesn't have that connection yet. Eventually, the sea is going to be about loss. Um, he's going to kind of get that later on, but he doesn't get that at all. We don't hear, we don't see any element of that. It's about, it's about hope. It's about longing. It's about, it's all good things. Um, whereas, again, for Legolas, he knows his own recognition of the fact that his heart can no longer be content. Um, uh, on in the forests that he loves anymore uh, is um, is the main thing that he focuses on even more than his desire uh, his desire for the sea and his desire for um, uh, uh, for the west that lies beyond yeah, I just keep thinking about Legolas because of uh, all of those references I love the fish swimming around in the water. And the ships off in the distance. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, I should let people go. Thank you, Phoenix. Thank you, Druid's Fire, for your hospitality here at your uh, at your kin house. Um, I... Uh, um, It's always fun to... I always love coming to Gondor. Which, of course, my characters haven't made it to in-game yet. Outside the form of a chicken and a couple brief illicit traveling. Um, so, thanks, everybody. Don't forget, film film on Friday. Uh, uh, Treason of Isengard next Wednesday. Game of Thrones roundtable uh, on the 25th. Uh, see you guys next week where we shall actually go into the old forest uh, in our discussions. <laughs> so thanks everybody and I will see you guys next week. <laughs>